Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship, both members and visitors alike. A joy to have you here. We welcome those who are joining us by means of Facebook here this morning as well. We'd love to know that you have joined us, so please leave us a comment or like us there on our Facebook page. As we travel throughout the, the church here, we celebrate seasons and festivals such as Advent and Christmas, Epiphany, Lent and Easter. But as we travel throughout that church here, there's also one Sunday set aside for us to focus on our triune God. And that is Trinity Sunday, and that is today. While we recognize that our God is triune in every worship service, as we begin in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we close with that aspect of the threefold blessing, as we confess Father, Son, and Spirit in the, the creeds, today we have that opportunity just to be reminded of who it is that we truly worship. It is one true God, who is one God in three persons, and three persons in one God. We'll be following the order of service that is printed there in your service folder, or you can follow along as it is projected in front of you. And we will begin this morning with the singing of hymn 297, which we find in the red hymnal that is underneath your seat, and we'll remain seated for the singing of all of the verses here this morning. God's blessings on your worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. Our Savior Jesus Christ commanded baptism when he said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All of us are born into this world with a deep need for baptism. From our parents we inherit a sinful nature. We are without true fear of God and true faith in God and are condemned to eternal death. But Jesus took away our sin by giving his life on the cross. At our baptism, he clothes us with the robe of his righteousness and gives us a new life. Our sinful nature need not control us any longer. We recall what baptism means for our daily lives as we speak these words. Baptism means that the sinful nature in us should be drowned by daily sorrow and repentance and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. 
as baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusted in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In obedience to the command of our Lord and trusting in his promise, you have brought Levi Wayne to be baptized. Jesus told us, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. It is in baptism that God grants the new life of forgiveness, joy, and peace to little children. By the power of God's word, this gracious watcher of life washes away sin, delivers from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe. Levi received the sign of the cross on the head and the heart to mark you as a redeemed child of Christ. Levi Wayne, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has forgiven all your sins. By your baptism, you are born again and made a dear child of your Father in heaven. May God strengthen you to live in your baptismal grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. In Virginia Gale, Shelley Ann, Micah Keith, and Landon Joseph, by the power of the word, the Holy Spirit has led you to believe that this new life in Christ is yours. Now in holy baptism, the Lord Jesus assures you of your salvation. That you may give public testimony of your faith, I therefore ask you. Do you believe that you were born in sin and therefore eternally lost? If so, answer, yes, I believe. Do you believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you believe that this triune God planned and carried out your salvation? If answer, yes, I believe. Do you believe that God grants you the forgiveness of sins in holy baptism? If, answer, if so, answer, yes, I believe. And do you desire to be baptized? Receive the sign of the cross on the head and the heart to mark you as a redeemed child of Christ. Virginia Gale, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Kellyanne, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Micah Keith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And Landon Joseph, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
The Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has forgiven all your sins. By your baptism, you are born again and made a dear child of your Father in heaven. May God strengthen you to live in your baptismal grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. The congregation is invited to stand, and we pray. Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of baptism by which you wash away sin and give us a new and eternal life. Help us each day to remember that through baptism, you clothe us with Christ, that we may stand holy and righteous before you. Look with favor on Virginia, Micah, Shelley, Landon, and Levi, that they may be kept safe by the gift of your spirit, grow daily in your grace, and live forever by the power of the risen Christ. Make us willing to carry out our responsibilities to all the baptized, so that all may finally come to the blessed joys of heaven, through Jesus our Lord. Amen. We rejoice and praise the Lord for the blessings of baptism. Almighty God and Father, dwelling in majesty and mystery, filling and renewing all creation by your eternal spirit, and manifesting your saving grace through our Lord Jesus Christ, in mercy cleanse our hearts and lips that, free from doubt and fear, we may ever worship you, one true immortal God, with your Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson this morning comes to us from the book of Genesis as we read chapter 1 and a portion of chapter 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was undeveloped and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good. He separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, and there was morning the first day. God said, Let there be an expanse between the waters, and let it separate the water from the water. God made the expanse, and he separated the water that was below the expanse from the water that was above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse sky. There was evening, and there was morning the second day. God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together to one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. The waters under the sky gathered to their own places, and the dry land appeared. 
God called the dry ground land, and the gathering places of the waters he called seas. God saw that it was good. God said, let the earth produce plants, vegetation that produces seed, and trees that bear fruit with its seed in it, each according to its own kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth plants, vegetation that produces seed according to its own kind, and trees that bear fruit with its seed in it, each according to its own kind. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning the third day. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to divide the day from the night, and let them serve as markers to indicate seasons, days, and years. Let them serve as lights in the expanse of the sky to give light to the earth, and it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He also made the stars. God set these lights in place in the expanse of the sky to provide light for the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning the fourth day. God said, let the waters swarm with living creatures and let birds and other winged creatures fly above the earth in the open expanse of the sky. God created the large sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their own kind and every winged bird according to its own kind. God saw that it was good. God blessed them when he said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters of the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning the fifth day. God said, let the earth produce living creatures according to their own kind, livestock, creeping things, and wild animals according to their own kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their own kind, and the livestock according to their own kind, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its own kind. God saw that it was good. God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that crawls on the earth. God created the man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God said, Look, I have given you every plant that produces seed on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that bears fruit that produces seed. It will be your food. To every animal of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. There was evening and there was morning the sixth day. The heavens and the earth were finished, along with everything in them. On the seventh day, God had finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had been doing. God blessed the seventh day and set it apart as holy, because on it he rested from all his work of creation that he had done. This is the word of our God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Our second lesson from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, reading verses 11 through 14. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Set things in order, be encouraged, agree with one another, be at peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the word of our God. On this Trinity Sunday, we confess our Christian faith with the words of the Athanasian Creed, and we do so responsively. Whoever wishes to be saved must, above all else, hold to the true Christian faith. Whoever does not keep this faith pure in all points will certainly perish forever. Now this is the true Christian faith. We worship one God in three persons, and three persons in one God, without mixing the persons or dividing the divine being.
What the Father is, so is the Son, and so is the Holy Spirit. The Father is uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father is infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father is eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. Yet they are not three who are eternal, but there is In the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, the Holy Spirit is almighty. Yet they are not three who are almighty, but there is one who is almighty. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Yet they are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. Yet they are not three lords, but one Lord. For just as Christian truth compels us to confess each person individually to be God and Lord, so the true Christian faith forbids us to speak of three gods or three lords. The Father is neither made nor created nor begotten of anyone. The Holy Spirit is neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeds from the Father and the Son. And within this trinity, none comes before or after, none is greater or inferior, but all three persons are co-equal and co-eternal, so that in every way, as stated before, all three persons are to be worshipped as one God, and one God worshipped as three persons. Whoever wishes to be saved must have this conviction of eternity. It is furthermore necessary for eternal salvation truly to believe that our Lord Jesus Christ also took on human flesh. Now this is the true Christian faith. We believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and man. He is God, eternally begotten from the nature of the Father, and He is man, born in time from the nature of His mother, fully God, fully man, with rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father as to His deity, less than the Father as to His humanity. And though He is One, not by changing the deity into flesh, but by taking the humanity into God. One, indeed, not by mixture of the natures, but by unity in one person. For just as the rational soul and flesh are one human being, so God and man are one Christ. He suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven, is seated at At his coming, all people will rise with their own bodies to answer for their personal deeds. Those who have done good will enter eternal life, but those who have done evil will go into eternal fire. We continue with the singing of hymn 483, which we find in the blue hymnal.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel, which serves as our sermon lesson here this morning. We read from Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some hesitated because they were uncertain. Jesus approached and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and gather disciples from all nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and by teaching them to keep all the instructions I have given you. And surely I am with you always until the end of the age. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. We pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever wondered why we call what we are doing right now worship? The answer is actually quite simple. You see, the English word worship comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word, which literally means to ascribe worth to something. So when you worship someone, you are assigning worth or value to that person. In our lesson here this morning, we see that as the disciples come to Galilee and they meet Jesus, they worship him. We have gathered together here today in order to worship the one true God, and we do that in many different ways. We do that by setting aside time and adjusting our schedules to make sure that we are here. We do that by singing from our hearts and with our voices to the one true God. We even do that by setting aside a percentage of our hard-earned money and then give it to God as a way of saying, that's, dear Lord, how much you are worth to me. And so if we are going to do all of these things, if we are going to build our lives around this God that we worship, if we are going to trust in him to provide us with all the most important things in life, it is vital that we know who this God is that we worship. And the word of God that stands before us here today gives us such information as it teaches us that the one true God, the God that we worship, is a triune God and a caring and powerful God. Now when we say that God is a triune God. We are saying that the one true God is one God in three persons and three persons in one God. It's what we just confessed in those words of the Athanasian Creed. And is this triune God that we see in our lesson, as Jesus says, go and gather disciples from all nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The three persons of the one God are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and just what do we know about this triune God? Well, because this truth is a truth that goes beyond our simple and sinful mind and goes beyond the ability for us to completely comprehend it, we need to turn to the one place where our triune God has actually revealed himself to us, to the Bible. And a good place to go is that lesson that we read, first of all, here this morning from Genesis chapter 1. There, in those words that we read, it's more than just an account of creation. It presents us with the one and only true God. He is standing there on center stage as he calls all things, both visible and invisible, into existence by the mere speaking of his mouth. And that also included mankind. That means that the triune God is our creator. 
And pause, pause for just a moment, and honestly and truly ponder on that deeply. The only reason you exist is because of him. The only reason that you have anything in this life is because of him. And therefore, it only stands to reason that if he is the author of our life and of this world, he does indeed have every single right to tell you how you are to use the things that he has given you and how you are to live your life. So what does he say? Well, let's turn to another section of God's word that deals with our triune God from Isaiah chapter 6. And here in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is called to be a prophet of the Lord. And as he is, he is given a glimpse of heaven. And this is what he saw. I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And that means that our triune God is holy. Now, to be holy means to be pure and sinless. But let's make sure we understand something properly here. Even though, and rightfully so, holy means sinless, as our holy God, it also means that he opposes sin. So, the one true triune God, the holy God, comes to you and to me and he says this, be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. But is that what he sees when he looks at us as we live our lives from day to day? Does he see pure and sinless people? Isn't it true that far more often, as he watches us live our lives, he sees people that oftentimes are worshiping the created things rather than worshiping the creator? I know that that's what he sees in my own life. Don't you have to say the same for yours? And isn't it true that the way that we adjust our schedules and the way that we set aside our time and the things that we make sure that we get to oftentimes reveal that what is most important in our life and what we value the most are things like this. Work, money, Family, sports, respect, ourselves. Isn't it true that when he watches us live our lives, that what he oftentimes sees are people who flippantly dismiss his authority to tell us how we are to live? And instead, we tell him, whether with our words or with our actions, I'm going to do what I want to do, what makes me happy, and you're not going to tell me anything otherwise. So no, when he looks at us in the way that we live our lives, he does not see pure and sinless people. No, instead what he sees is he sees people who have failed and fallen short of the holiness that he demands. What he sees are people whose sins have separated us from our holy God. So what are we going to do? Well, I suppose somebody might say, well, it just means I have to try harder. But let's be honest. No matter how hard you try, you'll never be holy and sinless, will you? Maybe somebody else will say, well, I just need to do more good, and I can erase the bad. But let's be honest and think logically for a moment. If somebody commits a murder and then does a lot of good afterwards, does it remove the fact that they committed the murder? No. No amount of good works will ever rem remove or erase the sins we've committed. I suppose a person might say, well, I'm not perfect, but nobody is. At least I'm better than most. Than most. 
But there's a problem with that too, isn't there? God doesn't come to us and tell us to compare ourselves to other people. He tells us to compare ourselves to his holiness. You see, all human efforts are always going to fail. But dear friends, that does not mean that we are without hope. You see, our triune God comes to us and he reveals something else about him that he wants us to know. He reveals that he is a God of grace and mercy who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. But because that is something that we cannot bring about ourselves, our triune God must do that work. And so, prompted by love, God the Father sent his Son into this world to die for us. And pause once again, please. Just think about that. It's absolutely incredible. The creator of the universe against whom we have sinned again and again and again, loves you so much that he wanted nothing for you but that you be saved from your sins. And God the Son willingly carried out his Heavenly Father's will because he shares that love for us. And so he came into this world to create peace between us and God. But the only way that was possible is if Jesus cleared away the sin and the guilt that separated us from God and made it possible for us to actually stand before God pure and sinless. That's exactly what he accomplished with his life, death, and resurrection. And then God the Holy Spirit joins us to Jesus when he works through the gospel message in the word, powerfully working through our hard hearts to lead us to the point of where we are willing to listen to and then we believe Jesus is our Savior. And so now, through faith in Jesus, as God looks at us, what does he see? Pure and sinless people forgiven, covered in the righteousness of Jesus because of the blood that he shed on the cross for us. So are you getting the picture as to why it's so important to understand and know who the God is that you worship? It's this reason that the author of the Athanasian Creed could so boldly and correctly write This is the true Christian faith. Whoever does not faithfully and firmly believe this cannot be saved. Did you notice how this also shows to you just how much your triune God cares for you? God the Father cares for you so much that he sent his son to die. God the Son cares for you so much that he willingly went to the cross, that he was willing to endure the torment of hell that our sins deserve. The Holy Spirit cares for you so much that he worked faith in your heart and made you a child of God. He cares for you so much that he continues to maintain that faith through the word of God. And did you hear the marvelous promise that your triune God gives you? Surely I am with you always until the end of the age. Now you might say, well, pastor, if you go back and look at those words, it's actually Jesus who says those words. You're right, it is. But it's also proper to say the triune God gives you that promise because all three persons of the Trinity cannot be separated. That means the Father's protection and providence is there with you. The Son is always going to be your Savior. and The Holy Spirit will continue to preserve us in the true faith and reassure us again and again that through faith in Jesus, our names are written in the book of heaven. And do you get what this means for you? It means that in all reality, there is never a point in your life on this earth when you are really alone. When you're on your way to work or in the car, the Father's there. When you're going through that illness or through the treatment for that disease, the Son is there. When the pain comes and it just doesn't go away, The Spirit is there. Never. No, never. Not when you are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Not after the loss of loved ones. Not when bills get tight. Not when everything in life seems to be going the wrong way. Never. Never is there a time in your life when your Savior is not there with you. And He is there with all authority 
in heaven and on earth, being used for your good. He lacks no power. He lacks no knowledge of your situation. He lacks no ability to preserve your faith. And he lacks no ability to work all things that are going on in your life at that moment to safely bring you to your real home in heaven. You may have heard it said before that the word trinity or the word triune, you actually will never find it on the pages of Holy Scripture. But that doesn't need to disturb us in the least. It is simply a a term that Christians have come up with that briefly explains the truth of what we believe about God, the one true God. You see, the one true God, the only God, is one God in three persons, three persons in one God. Oh, is it a mystery? (laughs) You better believe it is. But you want to know what isn't a mystery? What we do clearly understand is that our God, the one true God, is the God of our salvation. He planned it all, executed it in and through his Son, and then made that saving work of our Savior beneficial for us as the Holy Spirit worked faith in our hearts to believe. Truly, he is worth more than anything in all of this world. Truly, he is worthy of our worship. Amen. And now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
congregation may remain seated. At this time, we invite Virginia Peden to come forward. Dear members of Faith Evangelical Lutheran Church, Virginia Peden, having been baptized and instructed in the teachings of the Word of God, desires to become a member of this congregation. Sister in Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ promises to confess before his Father in heaven those who faithfully confess him on earth. You are here to make a public profession of your Christian faith and unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your heart to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you this day in the presence of God and of this congregation acknowledge that in your baptism God gave you forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation? If so, answer, if so, answer I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you reject the devil along with all his lies and empty promises? Do you believe all the books of the Bible to be the inspired word of God? Do you believe that the teaching of Faith Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from God's word and instruction class, is faithful and true to the word of God? Do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith, be diligent in the use of God's word and sacraments, and lead a godly life even to death? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Will you support with your prayers, time, talents, and offerings the work our Lord has given to this congregation? Virginia, may the Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, renew and increase in you the gift of the Holy Spirit. To the strengthening of your faith, to your growth in grace, to your patience in trouble, and to the blessed hope of eternal life. Rejoice in the truth the psalmist proclaimed, and which is true for you. Surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Having heard your, your promises, we, the members of Faith Evangelical Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love, and invite you to join in the reception of the Lord's Supper. Share in our worship and mission, and participate in all the other blessings of salvation which God has given to his church in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith, in mercy you join this sister in Christ to your church when she was born again by the working of the Holy Spirit. In mercy you taught her your saving truth. Grant that she may offer herself as a living sacrifice to you as her spiritual act of worship. Transform her by the renewing of her mind so that she will not conform to the pattern of this world. Help us live in love and harmony with one another and work together in serving you. Keep us united in your spirit and bring us at last to your eternal kingdom where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. And the congregation is invited to stand as we pray. Our loving Father, we come to you in the name of our Savior, who suffered so much for us. We have confidence that our needs are known to you, and that out of the abundance of your mercy, those needs are met. Watch over your children who are suffering, Karen Barabach, Penny Nikolai, John Lechner, and protect them in their time of pain and weakness. May they be sustained by faith in the assurance of your nearness and love. Grant that in their suffering, they might be a faithful witness to all your loving purposes. No Holy Spirit, sent by Jesus to guide us into all truth, shower your gifts and graces on all graduates. And we think especially of Zachary Miller, Micah Huggett, and Aspen Bew. Make them truly grateful to all who have helped them with their education. Enable them to use the lessons they have learned to advance their own welfare, to serve others, and to glorify your name. As they step into an uncertain future, strengthen them through your word and sacraments, that they may be comforted and reassured by your presence. Teach them to demonstrate true wisdom and understanding by fearing and loving you and by keeping your commandments. And merciful Lord and Savior, you have promised to be with your believers everywhere and in every circumstance of life. May the assurance of your abiding presence and loving care comfort and sustain Jerry Egan as he faces and undergoes surgery. Remove all anxiety and fear from his heart and lead him to rest all his confidence in you. Bless the work of the surgeon and give success to the surgery as it pleases you. Be with Jerry as he recovers 
and fill him with an abiding thankfulness for all your blessings. We pray these things also now in the, in the prayer you taught us, Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now we confess that you, with your Son and the Holy Spirit, are one God and one Lord, and we acknowledge you as our Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. May be seated. As one personally prepares themselves to receive the sacrament here this morning, you may find the inside cover of the red hymnal to be a benefit to you. We invite those who have expressed that unity of faith with us by membership within our congregation to come forward to receive the sacrament with us here today. Please come at the direction of the usher, for all is now prepared.
Please stand. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. seated for our final hymn. Indeed, what a gracious and merciful triune God we have. We see it displayed so much here today in the blessings of baptism, in the blessings of the sacrament of Holy Communion, in the spoken word as we hear that although our lives have not matched the perfection that he requires of us, Jesus' life did. And so that perfection is given to us as a gift received by faith. And although we have guilt, that guilt has been paid for with Jesus' death on the cross, and therefore we are pure and sinless. And therefore we can stand before God confident that we will hear him say those words on that last and final day, welcome, you who are blessed, receive this inheritance prepared for you. A joy to worship with all of you. And please, as, as you look there in your service folder in the bulletin, continue to keep um, all those baptized here this morning in your prayers. Um, and welcome Virginia to our, our membership here and our faith family as well. Just a few other announcements that I want to, to draw your attention to. Um, that is, please take note that later on today, I'll be heading over to Watertown for a pastor's um, conference. And we'll be there until Tuesday evening. Um, and then later in this week, starting Friday and then going to the following Thursday, I'll be gone for a short vacation. Um, if a pastoral emergency should arise, please give my cell phone number a call. You see it there in the service folder, um, also at the beginning portion of the service folder as well. Um, then also please take note, those who have been frequenting the Wednesday evening Bible study on 1 Corinthians, um, we are going to be meeting today at 11 o'clock or thereabouts um, when we get started. Uh, but we are going to meet here this Sunday, then Wednesday, and then the 18th. Um, three, three more lessons we still have to go through. Then also take note, those of you who signed up for a book, for the book reading Bible class, 
um, the God Loves Nobodies. That one will be beginning on the 21st of June, which is a Wednesday, 6.30. Those books will be made available in the, in the weeks to come. Um, I believe that's everything that I really wanted to draw your attention to. Please take time to look at everything else that is there. Um, and God's richest blessings to all of you. And God be with you till we meet again.